<laughs> we'll stay with the Ames uh, group and, and, and Gobi now, and Christine will give her talk, uh, and along with Sam Crew <laughs> uh, as co authors for dwelling in the Gobi Steppe, digging deeper into habitation from the Neolithic through the Song Moon period in southeastern Mongolia. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Christina Corollas and I'm a doctoral student at Yale University and I co-direct the Shiro Chile Archaeological Project with Asa and Lulu. Uh, today I'm going to expand on a different element of our research uh, at Shiro Chile, and that's the nature of living areas and domestic daily life in the southeast from Gobi in the past, uh, which remains poorly understood. Sorry, can you speak up to this? So mortuary archaeology has uh, a strong history in Mongolia. Uh, from the Bronze Age onward, it provides the predominant site type through which scholars have extracted inferences about Mongolian prehistory and ancient life ways. Uh, a holistic picture of cultural practice and change in the past nevertheless requires that mortuary data be bridged by sites that report daily domestic life and practice, uh, namely places of extended habitation. So this talk begins with a brief overview of habitational evidence from the Gobi steppe of southeastern Mongolia, including relationships to speculated cultural and paleoenvironmental shifts um, from the Neolithic through the Shunga period. Um, and I'll follow with discussion of a case study, um, and that's the long-term archaeological record from the microregion of Shirin Chulu. Uh, the result of the investigation by members of our project from 2020 to 2022. Um, I'll briefly highlight a set of two stratified habitation sites um, of distinct types and locations um, that represent two near consecutive cultural historical spans across this time. Um, so the first site, uh, Tsakulog Buju, um, is a stratified Neolithic settlement on the shore of a Paleo Lake, and it documents some basic aspects of material culture and subsistence practices during this period and is still under analysis. And the second site is uh, called Agum Bagum, uh, and it's the main subject of this case study today. Uh, it's a continuously occupied stratified cave site, um, and it's the first site in the region to provide a range of material cultural data to compare against the more substantial late Bronze Age and Shangdu mortuary record. Uh, these sites allow us to pr probe similarities and differences between patterns in mortuary data and contemporaneous patterns of domestic material culture and subsistence practice. And this allows us to complicate assumptions about dwelling practices and transitions in Gobi step history. So I have a map here um, that shows a few of the known habitation sites in southeastern Gobi and a few that are not in the southeastern Gobi and um, cave and rock shelter habitations that are similar to so habitation in the Gobi from the Neolithic to the Shunga period is marked by a series of transitions. From 7,000 to 3,000 BC, the now desert environment was characterized first by forestation and wetland expansion, and then eventually contraction, as the arid environment in modern Mongolia began to take shape increasingly throughout the Bronze Age. In turn, the subsistence strategies of the groups changed in relative concert with the environmental shifts alternating from high mobility hunting and gathering and potential low level agriculture to eventually shifting toward pastoralism by 1900 BC. So, much of what we know about this time and diachronic changes in material culture and lithic technology come from the excavation of a very limited number of stratified habitation sites in southeastern Mongolia. Um, so, the stratified habitation sites presented today from our work at Sharon Chulu add to a very, very small known repertoire of excavated stratified sites in the Gobi, um, which have pre previously provided such information. Um, and the most notable of these are Shabrak Lusu and Dulani Gobi. They share some common landscape and material cultural features with the habitation sites of Shirin Chulu. Um, Shabrak Lusu uh, in the center here uh, was discovered by Nelson in 1925 and excavated by Mongolian and Soviet researchers in the mid 20th century. Um, it's represented by its extensive surface scatters, including several cluster, clusters associated with parts, and uh, it's associated with extensive and sparsely vegetated dune fields and paleo lake basin. Uh, 
And site assemblages are primarily Neolithic and Bronze Age, um, with artifacts from both earlier and later periods. Dulani Gobi uh, is on the southeast of the Gobi Desert and was also discovered near an ancient lake basin and was surrounded by mountains and clay terraces. Uh, Perley and Sarah Jav discovered hearths surrounded by magnetite assemblages, including projectile points, flakes, adz and adzes and axes, rounding stones, pickaxes, spindle whorl, ostrich eggshell, and copper bronze slag. Um, researchers believe the environment was characterized by wetlands, streams, and woodlands at the time of occupation, um, and that inhabitants practiced a mixed economy of hunting, fishing, gathering, and low level agriculture. Um, and the assemblages suggest occupation from between 8,000 to 3,000 years before present. So that's the Neolithic from the end of the Late Bronze Age or beginning of the Early Iron Age. Uh, lastly, there's our Ool, which is also on this map, um, which is located like Shirtulu in the Desert Steppe Transitional Zone, concentrated between a Paleo Lake Basin and the eastern edge of a low north-south trending mountain range. Um, it contains a sim similar artifact assemblage, um, although there are no stratified sites as are Zarwul that have been excavated at this point. So as Boo mentioned, um, the Late Bronze Age brought not only pastoralism, but also corresponds with the appearance of monumentality and burials in the Gobi. And this dramatic shift in the archaeological record has greatly shifted the focus of archaeologists interested in the pre-Bronze Age versus the post-Bronze Age, Bronze Age context from habitation sites to cemeteries. So in the, in the course of focusing on the new monumental mortuary and herding traditions that arrived with the Late Bronze Age, investigation of habitation sites, the places of living, uh, where the extended dyna dynamics of daily life and domestic practice played out have been comparatively forgotten to the det detriment of scholarship across the periods. Mm -hmm. right. So this is a map of our site area. And so now we'll move on to discussing um, our finds of habitation areas at Shirin Chulu. First, I'll mention a few sites excavated between 2019 and 2021. The first is Kalai Sin uh, which was one of the first habitation areas investigated at Shirin Chalu, and it's located at the northern end. It's an open air campsite located along a terrace between two paleo channels, so between two lakes, I'm um, sorry, uh, river, river channels. Um, it was mapped in 2019 using a total station and a drone to map, and hundreds, if not thousands, of artifacts are present on this, this terrace. Um, Based on the survey, it represents a early Neolithic from early Iron Age habitation context based on lithic ceramics and iron slag surface scatters consistent with that range of time. Uh, in summer 2019, subsurface shovel testing yielded the presence of two parts. One of these was uh, floated, and these materials are uh, in the process of being radiocarbon dated. But no further excavation has been undertaken at the site. Uh, the next site uh, we have is Sako Gagamu And this is the, uh, this was the first known stratified habitation site found in the Shirinju area. This is another Neolithic from early Iron Age habitation site situated uh, on a southern facing hill slope near a modern winter herding camp. And it was located on the shores of what was once uh, at the time of its existence a marshy paleo lake setting. So similar to Kaile Sinshan, this site was located immediately adjacent to bodies of water and consisted primarily of a ceramic and lithic surface scatter. Um, in 2019, Dr. Dabapu began subsurface shovel testing at the site and uh, discovered approximately 30 centimeters of organic materials, uh, a layer of organic materials with the stratigraphy, which would indicate longer term occupation. Uh, so radiocarbon dating of an unidentified fauna long bone shaft fragment from the bottle, bottom of the habitation layers dated to approximately 4,000 BC showed that the occupation at this site ran from the late Neolithic through the start of the early Bronze Age when the Gobi Steppe shifted to the arid conditions that characterize it today. Uh, in 2021, Dr. Utzern was returned and excavated a two by four meter test unit um, expanding this habitation site investigation 
be able to have earth feature in the southeast corner um, and the fragmented animal bones throughout the application there. Um, also, an array of lithic materials, um, of course, red fried pottery, and other materials that indicate that the site was occupied, occupied into the late Bronze Age. No evidence of any kind of stone construction uh, was present in the tested areas, and thus we assume that use of perishable living structures this time. It's the plan view of the site. Uh, so, from these sites and in combination with the other known habitation sites from uh, southeastern Mongolia at these periods, we could see a consistent pattern related to placement uh, of settlement areas near bodies of water that existed during the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. These bodies began to disappear during the Late Bronze Age and later, and patterns of subsistence and the placement of dwelling areas shifted in concert. Um, notably, this occurred again with the appearance of herd animals in the area and a shift away from the continuous reoccupation of water adjacent sites. So after this time, sites of occupation would become more difficult to detect on the surface, um, especially in open air areas. Um, so in 2021, um, we were not able to be present in person due to the pandemic, but we uh, were able to carry out remote excavations um, well, through uh, our colleague, David Lutzerin, um, on our behalf. So he was able to preliminary, preliminarily search for more habitation sites that would date from later periods, if anywhere between the late Bronze Age to the Shunno period. We ideally wanted a spread of sites and data across these periods. The yeah. hope was that we'd be able to locate at least a few promising sites uh, that would be able to be explored with more intensity and a greater range of collection techniques and analytical techniques upon our anticipated return to the field in 2022. Uh, we assessed the survey area and selected a set of nine sites for shovel testing uh, based on surface status from a 2018 survey. These were all open air. And based on the assumed predominance of open air campsites in the past, this is typically the approach to even locate habitation areas. Um, here's one example uh, of the scatters that we were <coughs> looking at. And so all these red marks are the ceramics. You know, or so this is um, surrounding the zone of the river's cemetery that ACES has mentioned before. So these test pits ended up being unsuccessful in locating any kind of stratigraphy or evidence of living surfaces. This is a common issue at open air building sites, which are subject to deflation and extreme impacts of the elements. So the shirts on the surface were likewise not sufficient to. Uh, or retaining enough diagnostic features to be comfortably assigned to any particular area or era. So following this result, I thought at length about the issue of locating habitation areas, which is uh, a component of my dissertation research. Uh, so it was uh, as a result of these challenges that in 2022, I decided that it was necessary to try a different strategy to search for living spaces. So uh, this past season, summer 22 season, um, summer 2022 season, thus marked the beginning of excavations at other than one uh, well-preserved cave site with long-term occupation. Uh, as discussed by uh, my colleagues, Asa Cameron and Kendall Shulon Dashade, in the earlier presentation, mortuary contexts dating from the late Bronze Age to the Shangri period are abundant, and they've been studied extensively in the Shiren area since 2018. Um, in contrast, habitation sites are absent from the archaeological record. So a primary goal of this season, um, continuing from this preliminary 2021 work, was to focus on locating and investigating habitation sites that would be coeval to or post-date the arrival of pastoralism in this area. Uh, investigation of cave and rock shelter sites in the Shirin Chula area is a new strategy and an intentional pivot away from open air habitation site surface. The strategy paid off in 2022 in significant ways, resulting in initial discoveries at this site. Um, investigations at this incredibly well-preserved stratified site are intended to address the lacuna in knowledge and practices associated with daily living, including subsistence, lithic and craft production, and other domestic activities. And they're also meant to explore an alternative pattern of enclosed rather than open air habitation. 
Uh, one of at least two, so the site is one of at least two cave sites exhibiting painted red ochre art in the Asher Tula area. Um, it's a shallow cave measuring approximately 20 square meters, provides protection from wind, sun, and rain. And in recent times, its interior space has been used by herd animals, especially horses, as a shelter. Local residents can't re recall a time when it was ever used by humans. Um, it opens on the southern side of a granite outcrop and is framed by natural lintels covered in many places by red ochre paint, smears, and images. These illustrations are notable in that they span a very wide range of forms and can be found on nearly every surface. Um, this is a figure that shows uh, an array of drawings that we made. Um, some were pecked and some were painted, and often they were placed on top of each other. Uh, so these drawings and occasional pecked images de depict abstract faunal, human, and geometric figures and show affinities with broader artistic traditions in Golgi Altai and southern Siberia. They include also a recurrent set of poorly understood icons noted at other sites across Mongolia, included nearby Delbert Hunt. Uh, this is one example. So to the author's knowledge and consistent with the most recent literature on the subject, this site is one of only a few recorded Southeastern Gobi sites with painted cave art. Most other examples are found in North Central Mongolia and Western Altai. Um, so in this initial season of investigation, we opened 10 square meters, excavating in eight arbitrary levels to a depth, a depth of approximately 90 centimeters. Um, the first set 15 centimeters was a very thick layer of desiccated livestock dung, which actually acted as kind of a, a preservative cap. Um, um, following that, we dug in 10 centimeter levels using a total station and LIDAR photogrammetry. Um, we recover a wide range of organic and inorganic artifacts, some of which are rare both at habitation sites and in burials. Uh, finds in lower layers included, included personal items such as faunal teeth pendants, um, identified as sheep and goat teeth pendants, um, a dozen late or Bronze Age and early Iron Age beads made of various materials. Um, these include steatite beads and turquoise bead, um, which was interesting because we found the other first example of a turquoise, turquoise bead in a contemporaneous burial, uh, shaped burial in the same season. These are all made in production styles and sizes matching those found in these um, ex grave excavations. This is the first time that beads have been found outside of the grave context in this area. They also recovered a bronze bead, possibly among the earliest recorded in Mongolia. They've not been found yet in the mortuary context since Shirin <clears throat> Other common mm -hmm. finds include se um, several ceramic tripod vessels, thousands of brick. Butchered and burnt faunal remains, textiles, leather products, seeds, paper fragments with old Mongol scripts, and an array of metal remains of brass, iron, bronze, and copper. And numerous parts were found throughout the sequence, and including in the lowest layers, which were dated to the Bronze Age. Um, and these lower parts were associated with AMS dated ceramics, livestock remains, and pure copper remains. Um, Interestingly, and very unexpectedly, in the upper levels, we identified a religious shrine containing Buddhist and shamanistic materials. This shrine area was near the back wall and included several objects depicting Buddhist figures in clay and built wood. This shrine was surrounded by manuscript fragments with Mongol and Tibetan texts, silk and wool textiles, a Mongol period iron arrow, small handmade porcelain offering bowls, red lacquered wood fragments and iron nails. Um, it also included a significant number of small stone encircled ritual offerings of horse teeth, pine nuts, wheat, and hundreds of miniature clay votive stupa offerings arranged in circles or lines. These stupas were, were present in an array, an array of colors and may have functioned as miniature reliquaries, and they would likely contain a text fragment in their enclosed interiors. These materials are currently being analyzed by an expert in Buddhist material culture at the National University. So in levels five through eight, um, these Buddhist materials gave way to earlier material cultural traditions, beginning with a limited amount of Khitan wares. Below this were hundreds of shirts with carbonized food residues used as cooking vessels. And most of these exhibit design features from the late Bronze Age to the Shonu period, 
We confirm these with estimated dates, or these estimated dates with a set of AMS radiocarbon dates on food crusts from five shards recovered in the two lowest levels. And these results indicate that the lowest levels were occupied from 1393 through 774 BC. These are all um, dated ceramics, and except for the swamp in the corner, which is a triangle leg. So diet and subsistence in this area of Mongolia from the late Bronze Age through the Iron Age is a main research question and driver of habitation site investigations. And as such, uh, many of these well-preserved late Bronze Age and Iron Age cooking vessels made in a fine and thin-walled style not seen previously will undergo uh, organic residue analysis at the University of York as part of my dissertation research, where I'll analyze them for lipid and protein residues in fall 2023. I'll do the same for other materials and human remains from contemporaneous burials. Including, uh, this also included uh, thousands of butchered and marked fall remains throughout the sequence, which are currently under analysis. And they uh, span a range of herd species from cattle to horses, cattle to horses to sheep and goats uh, within various age classes. And these have been submitted for AMS radiocarbon data as well as stable and radiogenic isotope analysis. Uh, we also documented hundreds of lithic artifacts from lower levels, uh, including a wide range of types, microblades, microblade forests, thumbnail scrapers, burins. Um, lithic technological chain in Mongolia uh, from the Neolithic through the Shona period is a very poorly understood and active research top topic, and we hope that finds in this stratified site might be able to shed light on this. So as we prepare for excavations in 2023, we anticipate evidence of earlier occupation at Adin um, through the Bronze Age and possibly the Neolithic or Upper Paleolithic. Um, as noted in the beginning of the presentation, the type of long-term stratified occupation that we are documenting here is rarely found in Mongolia and is almost completely absent for the Gobi Steppe region. So this site ideally should provide much needed data about the arrival of mobile pastoralism and we're optimistic about the site's potential to clarify long-term diachronic changes in daily practice and social organization leading to the Shaman period and the emergence of the first nomadic empire in East Eurasia. So uh, our upcoming plans include continuing work at this site um, and it also includes test units at two other similar sites. Uh, that we discovered in the southern portion of the research area at the end of the 2022 field season. Um, you can see the first of these. Um, this is the second site. Uh, both of these sites exhibit similar conditions and similar evidence of cultural activities, um, they, namely in their protected overhanging enclosures and the prevalence of red ochre illustrations on rock faces. Here are some. Preliminary tracings from one of these sites. Um, so in, this summer, we plan to investigate these sites and determine whether similar patterns of occupation may have occurred. Um, finally, I want to close with what I think is an apt set of images. Uh, the drum produced plan view marking the rounded and deeply indented traces of our own camp dwellings, which have persisted over the years in the spaces to which we return to set up camp each year. Thank you. Questions for Christine? No question. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you find some texts in these dwellings. Uh, are there any other contemporaneous texts that have been identified or exist? Uh, in this area, no. Oh, but this, what we found in this, uh, the organic preservation in, in this site was just extraordinary and um, pretty unparalleled. There's, I think that the protection from the elements and the kind of cap of dung on top of the, over the top of the site allowed certain materials to preserve that we just would not be able to find elsewhere. Um, so we have not at any other sites found texts like this. And there's been no new information about what these texts represent? Uh, not yet, but we do have a scholar who uh, has those materials and I believe is working on um, trying to read them if possible. We did have some students that tried to read them and, and couldn't make out what they said. Mm -hmm. 
questions. You talked about you having some challenges to finding evidence of habitat sites, right? And so I guess that's probably to do with the erosion. Yes. So I think road is quite active in the roading in the area. And so, um, so the second question is, you talk about area already. So um, how did you, you know, find that, you know, find that area like, is it suggested like, suggested to me that, I mean, what I think is probably climate was a little different, more precipitation, right? But we, I often wonder, there are some habitats in in the, been living in the Soviet thousands of years back, so where they're finding the water, right? So it's need to be closer to water. So it's interesting to me that your site had is carry away. Uh, yeah, the these paleo bodies, water, paleo lakes, paleo rivers are all over our area. Um, these have been. Um, sampled actually by a geomorphologist that we are working with, um, and we are waiting on results from that. But but she was able to identify and and uh, collect sediment samples from I think nearly a dozen of these. Uh, but they're very obvious on the surface, and we actually have um, a set of cores or like a stratigraphy from these bodies of water. The sediments from former bodies of water that have been radio from data as well. But it is uh, pretty well that's understood at this point that in the Gobi, the Gobi was a much wider place um, in the Bronze Age and Neolithic. It was even marshy, and you would have had large bodies of water. Um, I think that it would almost be unrecognizable to us now. Um, but um, um, the shifts that happened required people to really adapt, I think, and um, that's what we're seeing in these changes. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, I studied millions of years back, right, so back in times of time, climate was totally different, much more, you know, body of water, you know, maybe a little bit more um, education, but still kind of so for me, it's interesting that see thousands of years back, so that we were actually wet too, right? So I think the country is changing. Now, of course, it's very dry, it's not much of hot and water. Yeah, I think it's very easy for us to expect to look at the conditions now and expect that they were the same even up to very recent times, or, you know, even throughout, expect that they were the same throughout the whole scene. It turns out that that, <clears throat> that wasn't the case, and that humans, even a few thousand years ago, were really having to deal with significant shifts, and it's just really changing their lifestyles. Thank you very much, Christine.